Welcome to Extraterrestrial Reality. In a recent episode, I talked about a strange UFO encounter that happened in the early 1950s uh, to American forces that were uh, fighting in the Korean War. And in the past, I've also talked about uh, Foo Fighters during World War II and, uh, and also about uh, some of the uh, UFO sightings that have been seen in conflict areas within the Middle East. Uh, but I never really talked about uh, UFOs during the Vietnam War. Uh, the Vietnam War, of course, lasted from 1955 until the fall of Saigon in 1975. The United States uh, military ground forces uh, entered the Vietnam War in 1965. Uh, and uh, during those years, there were some cases where some of the uh, American personnel that were in Vietnam actually saw uh, UFOs, encountered UFOs, and I want to talk about that today. Uh, and I want to talk about it because I came across a posting on Reddit by someone whose uh, elderly father who was in Vietnam has, has been telling him about his uh, encounters that he, when he saw UFOs in Vietnam. And uh, this was uh, from a user on Reddit named Osimo5001. He says, I've been talking to my dad about his experience with unidentified flying objects in Vietnam. Here is his first response. And actually, his father operated a UE helicopter, and that's where he was. That's when he saw that saw uh, these things. Anyway, uh, here was a quote from this guy's father. He says, "I chased them with an UH-1H UE. It was a special mission. Sightings were recorded of low-level aircraft." that flew over our two corps in Vietnam. A special team was brought in with the electrical gear and operators. It was at night. We couldn't see them. Only the equipment could detect them, and they instructed us which way to fly. Whatever it was, no aircraft could move, stop, turn, and fly low level as that did. Again, the higher-ups knew of the existence of such flights, hence the special radar equipment they sent on board. It occurred for about a week. We were never told or heard anything from it. And then he said he's going to ask his father more questions, and he actually did. He actually posted another post on here where he had a question. He 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 included the questions that he asked asked his father and and the answers. He says uh, one of the questions was, uh, "Can you tell me more about the special mission? How did you get assigned to it, and what were the specific objectives?" And the answer was, "I was the ops officer. The mission came from a division, and I assigned myself." Who was part of the special team with the electrical gear? Do you know what kind of equipment they were using and how it worked? And the answer was, have no clue. They had civilian clothes. Uh, what was it like flying the UH-1H UE during these chases? Did you notice any unusual behavior or effects on the helicopter? And the answer is, never saw them. It was all low level and I was more concerned not flying into the trees. Uh, how did the equipment detect these low-level aircraft? What kind of instructions did the operators give you while in flight? And the answer is yes, it was all low-level. Took instructions from the EQ operators. Even though you couldn't see them, did the operators provide any descriptions or data about the size, shape, or speed of these objects? And the answer is no, except wholly blank, that can't be when instructing us the route. How many times did you go out on these missions? Was it a nightly occurrence for the whole week? The answer is I seem to remember it was only it was a couple of missions. That was 55 years ago. What was the general reaction among the crew and higher-ups after these missions? Were there any debriefings or follow-up investigations? Uh, the answer is have no idea. Uh, what did you personally think these objects were at the time? Has your opinion changed over the years? And he thought they were Russian helicopters dropping, dropping off the bad guys. Did you or any of your colleagues experience or hear about other unusual sightings or incidents during your time in Vietnam? And he's, the answer was no. And he, the final question is, did this experience have any impact on your military career or your views on unidentified flying objects? No, we were only the taxi drivers. Now, that's that's not that exciting, but it, it, it made me want to look into uh, some UFO sightings in uh, that occurred in Vietnam. Uh, other stories. I know that there were a lot of, a lot of other incidents with uh because I remember reading about some of them in, in the past. And this was something interesting. This is from, uh, uh, from the National Archives. And it was a post that was written by uh, Joe Gillette, a process, processing archivist at the uh, National Archives. And he writes this. He says, During the Vietnam War, M American Army commands maintained daily, journal daily journals documenting assorted events. Most entries were relatively mundane, documenting staff meetings, personnel travel, incoming or outgoing messages, and the like. Some were more administratively significant, such as changes in command, the awarding of medals, or the filing of reports. 
Naturally, many contain descriptions of combat against the enemy. Then there are entries that are more closely re- that more closely resemble an episode of the X Files than a war movie. One such entry appears in the January 6, 1969, Daily Journal of the 23rd Infantry Division's Chu Lai Defense Command. The command's mission was to coordinate ground defense of the Chu Lai Defense Sector on the Vietnamese coast, about 40 miles southeast of Da Nang. Base defenses included a system of numbered observation towers ringing the base. Towers routinely reported anything unusual or potentially threatening to the base. At 0152 hours, or 152 a.m., the day's journal records Tower 72 making such a report. And here's, here's the report. It says, Tower 72 reports object flying into their area about 700 meters in front of them, azimuth 310 degrees. Object came in slow over the ASP and landed. When object moves it has a glowing light it is about 15 to 20 feet across as it is it is shaped like a big egg control tower reports their radar did not pick up pick anything up object also does not seem to have any sound to it when it moves now the guy who wrote this little piece here in the for, for the national archives uh, attributes this to potential drug use which i find ridiculous anyway it says the only logged follow-up action was notification of the duty officer. Subsequent journals provide no further information on the incident. Peculiarly, if one is conspiratorially inclined, the journals for the next two days, January 7th and 8th, are missing. Yeah, I wonder why. Possible conventional explanations for the sighting exist. Tracer rounds and flares both create illumination, but tracer rounds don't float to the ground and certainly aren't shaped like an egg. And flares might float to the ground but aren't egg-shaped either. Additionally, Drug use by soldiers, particularly by 1969, was a known problem in Vietnam. Let me just stop there. Uh, it would have to be pretty, really, really strong drugs to be for, for a bunch of people to, to re- be reporting this kind of thing, and I just don't buy it. I don't buy it for this case here. Assuming this was a drug-induced vision, it's difficult to imagine they each experienced the same hallucination, although if they were observing something they could not readily identify, one might have convinced the others they were seeing a UFO. Boredom, too, could have resulted in a bout of creative storytelling, but if discovered, the soldiers risked disciplinary action so while potential conventional explanations exist for both the sighting and the report nothing in the journals tells us which of those might have been at work the truth may be out there but it isn't in these records yeah they won't be in those records anything with these ufos is always hush hush don't talk about it and never say a word to anybody and then there was another article that I found that it was originally posted in FateMagazine.com. And that article also featured a, pe- uh, a, a picture uh, uh, that some believe is the only UFO photo taken during the Vietnam War. And this was from the archives of the late UFO investigator Wendell Stevens. Uh, it says this is, uh, in this picture, it says this is the only known UFO photo taken during the Vietnam War. It was shot with an Electro 35 Yashkima, Yashica camera by an American serviceman traveling in the back of an army truck along a country road near Chu Lai in March of 1967. Yeah, it looks like a, like the, a classic flying saucer just hovering there in the air, and somebody was able to grab, the, grab a picture of it. Anyway, this article, uh, this was uh, written by Antonio Junius, and uh, this is what he writes. He says, The war was still a fresh and tragic memory when I came to this country in 1975. I met countless people who had either served themselves or had close, rel- friend, or close relatives or friends who did. As I became interested in ufology from 1977 on, some of the first stories I heard were war-related. War My friend John Miranda, who was the first to show me evidence for UFOs, heard firsthand an account from a co-worker in 1972. Andy, not his real name, had just served as a United States Air Force technical sergeant in what he described was the intelligence center in Thailand that coordinated the military aircraft flights over all of Vietnam. As he put it, if there was a plane flying anywhere in Southeast Asia, this control center knew about it. It was probably the Na- uh, Nakhon Phanom Royal Thai Air Force Base, identified in FOIA documents discussed below. Andy reported that one day, probably in 1969, on multiple radars, they tracked an object traveling at a 7,000 miles per hour that repeatedly made right angle turns. They checked with the top commanders from Air Force, Army, Navy, and Marines. All confirmed they had no aircraft flying in that area at the time. Of course, the folks in the intelligence center were warned never to speak of this event. Yeah, of course. Yeah, don't you? Yeah, you didn't see. You didn't see what you what you what you saw. Don't ever say anything. That's of course how they want to be. 
Uh, that's how the government has always been with this. They, uh, they don't want to talk about it. Miranda added that Andy was a sharp individual without tendency to exaggerate. He knew exactly what he was telling me, and he had no reason to embellish the story. Thus ended my first Vietnam UFO story. And he talks about another sighting, and this was pretty interesting. The next sighting came from one of my mentors in the field, the late New York City police detective Pete Mazzola. Pete, who passed away in 1987 and then formed a national organization called the SBI for Scientific Bureau of Investigation. Uh, Pete served in Vietnam from 1965 until the end of that decade. Although I, heard, I had heard the story many times, I, I'd rather quote it from a 1982 article in a local New York paper, The News World, with the subtitle of Staten Island Researcher Inspired by Encounter in Vietnam War. The author was journalist Hal McKenzie, who later became a UFO activist and author. And here's a quote from Mazzola. There were several times while on patrol in the jungle that I had time to look up at the stars. I saw more than a few unusual shooting stars that maneuvered in a way no meteor could. Uh, one incident left an indelible memory in the young soldier. Uh, Mazzola couldn't remember the exact date, only that it was around 1966 or 67. Mazzola's patrol was pinned down in tall elephant grass when they saw something strange appear over the paddy fields and palm trees ahead. I couldn't believe what I saw, continued Mazzola. The other guys saw it too, but afterwards were too shocked to talk much about it except to say, what the hell was that? Mazzola's job as forward observer for his platoon was to call in the coordinates of enemy, enemy positions in the, to the United States uh, Navy ships. Mazzola heard the shells first and from the south, the American warships' positions, and then the objects began to receive artillery rounds in the other direction from the north, the Viet Cong. The shells never made the target. They all exploded short. We could see the black smoke puffs in the air. The detective almost implied the UFO was doing something to explode the shells prematurely. The object to continue hover silently, gracefully, said Mozola, and in less than five minutes shot straight up in the air and was gone. Now that's a very interesting story there. So basically the, the it's right in the middle of this conflict and there's, uh, there, there's shells getting blasted right toward it, but it's not the shells are doing nothing to it whatsoever. Uh, that sounds somewhat similar to the story that I was talking about recently that happened in Korea. You have to wonder, are, they, are the creatures, are, are these alien creatures, are they there to uh, observe the war, to watch how violent we are, to, to take notes, or, or is it just by chance that they're there? They're just all over the place and these people are outside all the time, you know, they're fighting in the jungle and every now and then if you're in the right place at the right time, uh, UFOs are going to show up. I guess we'll, <laughs> I don't know if we'll ever figure that one out. But I really thought this final st uh, story I'm going to talk about in this article was the most interesting. Uh, and it was published in the 1973 issue of Nightcap's UFO Investigator Newsletter and investigated by uh, Raymond Fowler. It occurred at the South Vietnamese Nha Trang base in June 1966, which housed over 40,000 troops, including 2,000 American GIs. The witness, an enlisted soldier with Specialist 5 rank, recalled that soldiers had gathered to watch an outdoors movie projected with a diesel generator. They had watched the film for a while when the sky suddenly lit up with what they thought were flares. It came from the north and was moving from real slow to real fast, the soldier told Fowler. Pilots on the base estimated the lights were about 25,000 feet high. Then the panic broke loose, continued the witness. The UFO dropped right toward us and stopped dead still about 300 to 500 feet up. It made this little valley in the mountains around look like it was the middle of the day. It lit up everything. Then it went up, and I mean up. It went straight up and completely out of sight in about two to three seconds. Everybody is still talking about it. And the witness also said at the time, all the generators on the base stopped. Everything went black. Even the motors of planes ready to take off stopped. And here's a quote. There wasn't a car, truck, plane, or anything that ran for about four minutes, said the, said the soldier. So if his recollection is accurate, this was a massive close encounter of the second kind with widespread electromagnetic effects. A whole plane load of big shots from Washington got here to investigate, the soldier said. Unfortunately, and of course this is always the case, isn't it? No documentary evidence or additional witnesses has emerged since 1973 to back up the electromagnetic effect or EME evidence. Did a UFO really trigger a big blackout on the Natrang uh, base with massive EME and on all kinds of engines? It's possible, but until we find a paper trail or additional witnesses, we can't say for sure. 
you know, I'm going to say for sure because if this is the <laughs> this stuff has happened all the everybody, you know, it's not just in conflicts. I mean, this is one of the things that happens. I mean, people's cars shut down. They all they're driving down the highway. All of a sudden, uh, UFOs hovering over their car, and the vehicle just shuts down. There's static on the radio. There's electromagnetic effects. This is something that's been reported thousands, at least a thousand times, thousands of times. Anyway, so that's where I just wanted to leave it at that. I thought though, there, there's more to this article. I'm going to leave links to all of these things. There's a lot more to read here uh, if you're interested. But I, I think that these cases are, are fascinating uh, when, when these uh, things, UFOs, show up in, in, in war zones for whatever reason. We have no idea if they're observing us and, and what we do and how we are. Or, or are they just, is it just by chance that they're there? Uh, I don't know. I have no clue. Uh, I, I would imagine they're, they're probably just uh, surveil it's uh, surveillance on their part to probably shake their heads and wonder what the hell is wrong with this this race, uh, this violent race. I mean, they need to get it under control. Maybe that, that, that's probably what it's all about. Uh, who knows? Anyway, uh, I want to talk about something. I wanted to update something. The other, the other day, I uh, uh, I was talking about uh, 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 John Stewart, the UFO. Uh, commentator uh, he had on his youtube channel he was talking about how he believes now that the uh, the, the majestic 12 special operations manuals mention of bb uh, uh bbs is uh, actually stands for the bermuda biological uh yeah, bermuda biological station mm -hmm. And, uh, and we're, and I, I, we, he, he doesn't, nobody's really sure what OPNAC in, in, in that, uh, document means. And we're trying to, you know, that's something that we haven't figured out yet. And, uh, com, you know, for sure. I think that, uh, Stuart, like I stated in that episode, I think he's correct about that. I think that B, the, the abbreviation, the acronym in the, in that leaked document, the leaked special operations manual, BBS, I believe that does stand for Bermuda Biological Station. Uh, but OPNAC is still a mystery. And uh, I don't know. OPNAV means Office of the Chief of Naval Operations. But OPNAC, it's only mentioned in that uh, special operations man manual. And, and what does it stand for? Uh, I don't know. Uh, now, uh, Stewart, like I stated in that, in that episode, he's, he believes it, me it means Operational Naval Command. I mean, he might be right. I, th I think it's just guesswork at this point. I don't know wh what it stands for. But uh, one of the comments on YouTube that I received on this from user F14JK says, OPNAC team, OPNAC team, OP, LP, he says, acronym for overpowered, NAC equals National Advisory Council, NACA equals National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics from, from, from NASA. I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, that's, he, he's, he's giving me, he, he was giving us some other, uh, uh, acronym other similar acronyms so that i mean i don't know if, if we could call anything from that or not but then there was somebody else that actually provided a <laughs> a bunch of uh, possibilities here and uh some of them are, are, are tongue-in-cheek i think but this was from randy mckernan and he says opnac team he provides a few uh, possibilities outer space phenomenon neutralization and cover-up team <laughs> Uh, or operational non-human artifact collection team. I mean, who knows? Maybe uh, obscure phenomena. North American North American command team. <laughs> or old people not available. <laughs> old people not available for comment team. I don't know, Randy. They're pretty. That's they're pretty good. I like. I like all of them actually. Uh, I don't know if, it, if that's what it is. Maybe the second one, operational non-human artifact collection team, but I don't. I don't even know about that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, and there's de and definitely not old people not available for comment team, but that's pretty much in reality. It could be that. It should be that actually. I know it's a joke, but uh, that's what it seems like it could be. But anyway, I also wanted to uh, get caught up on some of the Spotify polls. I haven't done them in a in a little bit, so I'm going to start back with. Uh, uh, for the episode, uh, some pro-UFO disclosure advocates apparently have other agendas. I asked this question. Do you believe it's possible there are, are dishonest actors within the UFO community who, who are hell-bent at keeping the ET reality from the public? And uh, there are, uh, let's see, uh, 53 votes so far with 17 days left. Five people or 9.4% say no, while 48 people or 90.6% say yes. 
uh, yeah, I think that uh, there are some dishonest actors within the UFO community. I'm, I've, I'm pretty much convinced of that now at this point. Not, I, mean, I don't know if there's that many. I don't know how many, but I know that there are some. I think that there are, like I've talked about this before, I, I think there are most certainly some uh, people in the UFO community who are uh, there to make sure that if any kind of uh, really good evidence ever emerges, uh, they want to make sure that uh, it doesn't get it doesn't go too far. And uh, so they'll pretend that uh, there's nothing to it. So, yes, I do agree with that. Uh, <clears throat> and then for the episode, UFO whistleblower David Grush files $2.5 million lawsuit. I asked this question. Uh, David, Gr does Grush have a good case against the Loudoun County Sheriff's Department? Now, before I get into the, what the poll answers for are, uh, I wanted to point out that uh, I, I, when I was doing the episode, I was pronouncing it wrong. Somebody pointed out I was saying Loudoun County. It's actually Loudoun County. So I, uh, I made that dumb mistake, and I wanted to make sure that uh, I correct it. So it's Loudoun. Does Grush have a good case against the Loudoun County Sheriff's Department? 42 votes so far with 19 days left. Two people or 4.8% say no. Seven people or 16.7% say not sure. And 33 people or 78.6% say yes. Uh, I agree with the yeses. I think he does have a good case. I'm not sure if they should have been turning that uh, personal information over. Uh, we, it was uh, a PTSD moment. With the, 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 that was the reason the police were called. And, and you know, it was all the, the, the reasoning that... Uh, uh, you know, Grush, that was all part of a hit piece uh, that was, you know, set up by people within the United States federal government, which is absolutely absurd. I, and he, you know, I, does he have a case against some people within the federal government? I think there, there could be a case there, too. I guess we'll, I guess time will tell. Okay, for the episode MUFON Platform's Absurd Explanation for the Roswell UFO Crash, uh, UFO crash, yes. Uh, Philip Mantle, the author, uh, uh, he, uh, he's the one who I, I, I couldn't believe that he wrote that article. But and and that and that it's it's one thing writing the article. It was another thing that MUFON platformed it and had a headline just saying uh, Roswell solved. I mean that was ridiculous. But anyway, I uh, I asked this question: Does Philip Mantle's explanation for the Ro Roswell UFO crash finally solve the case? Forty-five votes so far. Three people or six point seven percent say yes. While the vast majority, 42 people, or 93.3%, say no. Of course, I agree with the no's, uh, as everyone already made that clear in the show. Uh, you know, it's really strange, too. I mean, this guy, is he's, he's a great researcher. You know, I, I've been reading his book here, uh, Beyond Reasonable Doubt, The Pascagoula Alien Abduction. He co-wrote this with, with uh, Irina McCannon-Scott. And this is... This is unbelievably well researched. This is one of the, I mean, you can't if you if you want to know about the Pasca, 1973 Pascagoula event where uh, Charles Hickson and, and Calvin Parker were abducted by these weird looking aliens. I mean, this is this is it. I mean, this has everything in it. I, at some point, I'm going to do a review on this. This is this is a great, incredibly detailed book. And so it's it's you know after looking at this and and thinking about that article that he wrote, it's, it's surprising to me. It's very surprising that he that he that he uh, would push something like that. I, I just don't know what to say about it. But but this book that he wrote, and it was only it only it was only published last year. It's 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 a great book. If you want to know about Pascagoula, I haven't finished it yet, but I paged through a lot of it. I mean, there's so much information in there. He had they came up with other witnesses. They talked about things that we didn't even a lot of us didn't even know about before, like the the marks. There was injection marks apparently on the on the on the two uh, people who were abducted. It, it's just incredible. There's Oh, you know, there's the transcripts from hypnosis sessions that they, it's, 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 it's just a well-researched, a well-documented book. And, uh, I, I, I can't say enough from what I'm, from what I got out of it so far, it's, 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 it, it's definitely, if you want to read about Pascagoula, that's the book to get. So it's, it's still surprising to me that, uh, that, uh, Philip would uh, pen an article like that. I, I guess the more, the other issue to, that, that's an issue to me, for me. And also the fact that MUFON platformed it, but, uh, yeah, other than that though, that book, wow, fantastic. Okay, for the episode when flying jellyfish creatures attack, also Mantle responds to Roswell solved criticism. I ask this question: Do you believe intelligent flying jellyfish or flying squid exist on this planet and pose a threat to human beings? <laughs> Forty-two votes are uh, so far. Uh, five people, or uh, only only five people, uh, five people, or eleven point nine percent say yes. 
Uh, 16 people or 38.1% say no, while the vast majority, 21 people or 50% say maybe. Yeah, I guess I would go with the maybes. It sounds crazy, those stories. I, I mean, it's hard. I mean, it's just hard to believe. But at the same time, you know, the whole phenomenon is hard to believe, really, when you really think about it. But I know it's real because I experienced these things and we have proof that they're here now for sure, right? So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's why I'll have to go with the majority on it and say maybe. Uh, yeah, I'll go maybe on that one. Okay, uh, for the episode, nobody was prepared to deal with the Vegas alien slash, or excuse me, nobody was prepared to deal with the Vegas alien proof slash ET and UFO encounters of the 1800s. I asked this question, what did the 11-year-old girl from Maryland encounter near her home in 1883? Yeah, that, that, uh, in that episode, I talked about this strange case where this little girl went out to catch a, uh, fill up some uh, water from a well, and there was, all of a sudden, she became paralyzed, and then she saw some kind of weird creature. Could it have been an early encounter with an alien slash non-human intelligence creature? Possibly. Anyway, so far in this episode, 24 votes with uh, 24 days left. One person or 4.2% says she encountered a ghost. Two people or 8.3% say a supernatural being. Another two people or 8.3% say cryptid. And I should also point out that zero people said it was wildlife. And only one person said it or 4.2% say other. Uh, Five people or 20.8% say nothing. She lied. And uh, 13 people, or 54.2%, say it was an ET slash NHI being. You know, uh, I'm going with the majority. Yeah, I think it sounded to me like uh, it was an ET or NHI being. Those people actually thought it was some sort of supernatural creature or a ghost. Uh, I think it was probably uh, an an extraterrestrial, non-human intelligent creature because... We know that's what happens to people when they get close to them. The people in, in the in the years ahead would that's what would happen to them. So that's where I, I I'll have to yeah that's I'll agree I'll say that that's what I think too. And then uh, for the most recent episode, uh, artificial intelligence recognizes aliens present in Vegas video. I asked this question: How many UFO podcasts other than this one do you listen to? Seventy-two votes so far. Okay, uh, four people or 5.6% say five. Another four people or 5.6% say one. Uh, five people or 6.9% say none, that I'm the only one that they're listening to. Um, next in line would be, um, uh, yeah, nine people or 12.5% say two. Uh, 14 people <clears throat> or 19.5% say four. And the majority, 19 people or 26.4% say six or more. Yeah, I'm probably, I, I, I listen to a, you know, a several different podcasts. Uh, I talk about them on here sometimes. What, like some of my favorite shows actually on YouTube. Uh, I, I don't know, some of them, I don't know if you would consider them podcasts, but I think they are. I listen to, I, I follow Cosmic Road with Jack Connor all the time. Uh, he's always updating everything that's going on. I talk about that show a lot. I, I love Preston Dennett's channel. He talks about different cases every week. Um, there's some other ones on. I mean, there's quite. There's probably about four or five. I probably listen to on a regular basis. Uh, it's it's hard to keep up with it. I do a lot more reading, I think, than I do anything else, and also uh, looking for news and and different kind of information on UFOs on the internet. So that's pretty much how I I deal with it. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, I just want to say. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's interesting with these cases from uh, from Vietnam. There, there were a lot of UFO sightings. I find I find that picture uh, fascinating. I, I know some say that's the only image uh, that we know of, the only photograph taken of of a UFO uh, in Vietnam. Uh, yeah, I guess the question is: is why what why are uh, alien entities interested in uh, war zones? Uh, is it because they're just, it, they just they're everywhere and, and, and during wars, just like in any other situation where there's not a war going on, people see UFOs and is, is that the reason they're there? Or are they, are they surveil? Is it some sort of surveillance? Are they watching us? Are they, are they taking notes and, and, and uh, trying to figure out what we're up to and why we're doing this to each other? I, I don't know. It could, could, we don't know the answer. I, I, of course, obviously I think that they are 
interest. They're, they're, these beings are obviously concerned with our uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, they don't like that, obviously. Uh, they've sent out messages uh, numerous times, uh, according to reports. I mean, obviously, shutting down the, uh, sh shutting them down, shutting down nu uh, all the nuclear missiles at, uh, in Montana back in 1967. Uh, you know, and, and then l later on in Russia, uh, to actually activating them. Uh, so there, there. I think that's a message. I think there's a message getting sent about uh, about our use of nuclear missiles. I think I don't think the, these creatures uh, appreciate that, and uh, they're sending out a message. Uh, but as far as war zones go, what what's that all about? Uh, I don't know. Uh, they could be just could be just surveillance, or could just be chance. I, I you know any who knows? We just don't know. Uh, but it's something to think about. <clears throat> anyway, I want to say uh, thank you all for joining me. Until next time.